And uh, fortunately, we had a very nice proposal of, of um, how do you pronounce your name? Zunye. <laughs> Zunye, uh, from the CERN. So um, she will introduce herself because I don't have uh, any information about her <laughs> and about the talk. We will discover it together. Um, and that's it. This is your turn. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I am. Um, I think it will be a bit difficult to make this as interactive as I would have loved to, so um, in any case, I can hardly see you since you're fa fairly far away. Um, please interrupt me at any time because I have prepared tons of slides, um, but it doesn't mean that I'm actually um, intending to speak all the time. I would actually be more interested in feedback and um, questions and concerns, which I presume are around. Um, so I'm based at CERN, so I had a very short trip this morning. Um, I work on data-related challenges um, at CERN, so in high energy physics, but also across disciplines. One of the um, groups I'm working in is the Research Data Alliance World Data Systems Data Publishing Workflows Group. Um, that's where the cross-disciplinary examples are from that you're going to see in some seconds. Um, I think it's important to highlight that I'm not part of any publisher or any um, yeah, paid consortium or whatever. I'm paid by the, I have my own grant, I'm based at CERN, so I'm independent of any journal, etc. what I'm presenting. I'm trying to give a bit of an overview of what's happening outside um, high energy physics, and at the end of the presentation, I'm talking more about the physics examples that we work on. So um, I hope it's going to be comprehensive. Um, I have a background in geosciences, which might be surprising given that I work for a physics institute. But I did my PhD in library and information science, um, where I worked on data-related challenges um, across disciplines. So that's how I came to CERN. Um, this is um, what my presentation is about. And as said, please interrupt me at any time, and I really mean it. I'm used to that. Um, and um, I'm, yeah, just um, shout at me because I might not see it <laughs> um, if you have any questions. I'm going to start um, with topics that have already been addressed this morning. Um, why do we talk about data publishing? I briefly touch on the policy pressure. Um, then I'm going to present solutions across disciplines. I'm coming up with some standards. And the final part of the presentations are some examples in high physics. So from CERN. Um, please let me underline because uh, the discussions this morning raised some concerns in regard to openness. Um, my job title actually says that I'm an open science research fellow. And um, I like to underline that I'm not only uh, in favor of openness. So I like to, also my presentation will tell you that um, I'm in favor of pushing stuff out into the open because I um, belief in uh, future reuse and um, the need for reproducible research. I strongly believe in this. However, I also understand that not everything can be uh, pushed out into the open because of confidential um, reasons. Um, but also, um, I mean, I did a PhD myself. So um, if I conduct uh, research, I want to make sure it's correct and um, would like to make sure this, uh, I get my paper out of it before I get my data out into the open. Um, so I'm going, but I'm going to show you some measures how this can be done um, in parallel terms and that this, there is no contradiction. Any questions so far, concerns? Otherwise, yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, um, I think there are different um, meanings here because um, especially if you come from a more IT background or more... Um, I'm not a coder, so I'm um, more come more from a conceptual point. For me, reproducible research is um, the concept that um, me as a, as a researcher, if I read a paper and there is a scientific claim inside, um, that I am able to um, understand where this claim is based on. So, um, in, for example, in physics, that mainly means um, I have um, the code at my fingertips. I can go to GitHub, for example, um, look up the code, and um, see what the person has been doing. Um, usually in physics, that would mean um, I also have the data at my fingertips, um, so that I'm able, with the code and the data, to um, go down and uh, reproduce 
um, the claim, literally. So, um, and this also would mean, that's why I mentioned reuse, if, in theory, there is a new method coming up in another paper, I'm able to reuse the code or the data in a different environment as well. So that's for me, reproducible research. Um, others might have a different, a slightly different opinion on, on this, I think. Yeah, so more questions before I get started? Okay. Otherwise, yeah, again, please shout. Um, and actually, your question nicely underlines um, what I'm trying to say with this first slide. Um, it co compares two um, publications from the Royal Society um, from very different times. Um, and this is really um, well, the pu changing paradigm from uh, just um, paper publishing to um, science as an open enterprise, meaning that we now have the tools and services um, to make science reproducible and reusable. Um, and by this, um, we have been working on making um, data a first-class citizen, as you will hopefully see in the next um, 45 minutes, meaning that data becomes a product and its own, fully citable, fully um, yeah, a first-class citizen, as the paper it is. So um, this is from maybe a fairly CERN-based uh, point of view, um, because we have quite a focus or experience history of um, open source. And do I have a pointer here, by the way? Uh, maybe I should have brought one myself. Anyway. Um, can, ah, ah, you see it. OK, no, I won't use the mouse, sorry. Um, so we have an experience in uh, history in um, open source. Um, open access has been discussed um, in this part of open science, of course. I personally think it's a bit, um, and there, it's a, maybe a daring state. Sorry. <coughs> I think it's quite a solved uh, problem. And then um, the next um, step that I think is the biggest challenge right now is um, open data and um, um, code sharing, which um, goes beyond um, open source in a way that um, also should become a citable product. And in the end, we have um, hopefully the true open science vision. So why do we talk about this? Um, we've already heard from the European Commission and um, in some regards also from the Swiss um, counterpart this morning that there is some policy pressure, not only for open access, but also for data. Um, I'm showing here two examples um, which are relevant to my community, meaning physics. Um, one from the UK, STFC. Um, which funds um, the big scientific infrastructures. And they demand um, data management plans and open access to research data for research that has been funded with their uh, grants. They also um, use the term published, published data. Sorry, <coughs> I'm a bit sick also. Um, <coughs> so they use the term published data where is my mouse? Yep, sorry. And publicly available. So if you get money from them, you have to um, publish your data. The same um, happens um, for grants in the US. Um, the National Science Foundation is an example you might have heard of. Here I list the uh, Department of Energy, which uh, funds the big infrastructures in high energy physics. They also demand open data um, and machine readable and digital, ac digital <laughs> accessible to the public. So um, also open access to research data. All of them acknowledge, however, um, if you read the um, fine prints, that um, in under specific circumstances, there might be an embargo period and things like this. Um, so they are aware of um, concerns. This was um, the, there are two examples of a stick, as we call it. Um, another one, which uh, might be relevant uh, to some of you, even more so, <coughs> is the PLOS um, open data policy, which was released now almost um, a year ago, um, but has been um, revised meanwhile. And um, so who of you has published with PLOS already? I don't know from which disciplines are you from. Anyone published with PLOS? OK. Um, so um, if you intend to publish with PLOS, uh, you now have to provide the data. If you don't provide the data, um, your um, paper will not be published. That's um, the policy in its basic terms. Um, of course, there are 
um, also concerns about uh, confidential data, et cetera, et cetera. They're fully aware since this is a um, journal in the life sciences. But um, this is um, a discussion that happens across publish uh, publishers, across journals now. They have um, groups. So this is, I think, one of the first steps um, where we can see what's going to happen in the future. I'm very, very sure um, that there are more, many more data publishing um, policies coming from the journals and the publishers. I'm so sorry. <coughs> um, so. Um, as you, um, some of you raised um, this morning, there are concerns across disciplines. Um, the concerns raised this morning um, were, as said, um, regarding confidential data and um, data releases, others um, base um, claim, wrong claims on my data and things like this. These um, claims here come from the other side, from the other end, where um, data is just being neglected. It's forgotten in your drawer or um, on your home computer and not accessible for future reuse or reproducible research. So, now we are coming to the solutions. And I hope this is the um, more interesting part. Um, we have um, several solutions. I'm going to show you, I'm going to start with dedicated data repositories. You are, um, as far as I am aware, for many different disciplines here, so, um, obviously not covering all of them. I would just like come down to the basic principles so that we are able to assess uh, which, one, which criteria are important for us when we decide where to publish our data. So one example is Pangea, a data repository in the geosciences. Oh, thank you very much <laughs> for you. <laughs> so um, this data repository, um, is um, uh, one of the pioneers um, when it comes um, to data publishing standards. Why is this so? Um, this is nice, can nicely be seen in the next um, in this slide, where um, I um, put a box around um, the citation recommendation. So, um, if you are a geoscience, geoscience researcher, you can uh, submit your data here. In this case, this is supplementary data to an article. It's open access, so everyone can access this. Um, there is a persistent identifier, a DOI, assigned to this data set, which makes this data set a citable object. Um, you see here, nicely, in the red box, this is the citation recommendation and um, for the data set. Looks exactly like an article um, citation. And you see um, here that this is the supplement to an article published by Elsevier in this case, um, which also comes with a DOI. So you have two citation recommendations here. And if people reuse this data set, they are being asked, and this is um, going, being up, written up here, always quote the data when, you, um, when using it. Um, of course, you have no control, but I mean, it's community practice to cite. I mean, if you use an article, read an article, you cite it as well. It's just a matter of getting used to this. Um, also, this data has a dedicated abstract, and in this case, metadata for the librarians among us. It's fairly easy because it's um, geolocated. You also see, too, um, an interesting fact here, and this is what we call collections of data. So a data pu publishing can be done on two levels. So there are small-scale data sets at the bottom of the page, and um, overarching data sets. So and you can cite both of them. This is like um, as if you publish an as a, a paper as, in, as part of proceedings. So you can publish the article individually um, in, in the proceedings or the overall proceeding, how do you say, book. Uh, another thing, and that's actually one of my favorites, favorites these days, coming from an example, coming from a very different discipline, um, because it deals with sensitive data. So this is data publishing. Um, for like uh, involving clinical trials, patient data. It's um, the International Cancer Genome Consortium. They have a very new platform. It's a fairly new initiative. 
but they do provide access to data. They do facilitate easy data publishing, also using the same standard that I just explained, um, assigning a unique identifier, making a societable object. Um, but they do this in a, even in a very complex uh, global manner, which I find very, very, very interesting, I have to say. Um, because this is done in a global manner, collaboratively. Um, they curate the metadata globally together and they have um, arranged global access restrictions for confidential data um, and so that this is um, written here to the right. Um, they have strict rules um, for access to controlled data. So I find this um, fairly, as, I mean, I work for physics, we don't, have deal, we don't deal with any sensitive data. For us, I would say it's a, I mean, we do have concerns, as you will see later, but um, for us it's in such an example is um, impressive uh, be because, I mean, we don't have deal with such um, things. And um, because this is always a discussion, um, also this can be um, made um, open access, as said. I mean, some of this is controlled. Um, not part of the non-controversial data is um, open access and the accessible in the data portal. And um, they do have strict rules uh, when it will be published. They use embargo periods. So, um, in which apply, uh, I mean, that it's a, a very long document. This is just to give you um, an example, um, highlighting that it is possible also with such kind of data. You have to do it, it's may, maybe more complex, but you can push it out, either to the open or for controlled access. Another thing, and that's, um, I don't know if Lars already arrived, no, um, is, um, Lars is here as well, Lars is the main, um, guy in charge of the Zenodo data repository. Um, you might have heard about it. It's actually run at CERN. But um, this is a um, data repository focusing um, on any discipline. So if you don't know where to put your data, go there, submit it there. You can, if you have like a project um, or a working group which produces data, you can um, come up with your own community there and um, set up um, yeah, a kind of um, uh, yeah, your own community, online community, and um, curate and uh, publish your data there. Um, there is a Zenodo workshop um, later this afternoon um, where Lars will present the details of this data repository where we can have a bit of a hands-on experience. Right after this presentation or this workshop, um, Mr. Goebebecker will present um, the re3data.org um, data repository registry um, where you can look up um, the data repository that is relevant for your community. I mean, if you work in the life sciences or genetics or physics, go in there, look for the data repository and you find the place where you can publish your data. Um, so this is the, it will be a dedicated session afterwards. Um, the second thing when it comes to data publishing is um, something that you have already seen this morning, or uh, was mentioned this morning, data journals. Um, the previous speaker mentioned the Nature example. There are many more right now. So scientific data is definitely the most prestigious one, obviously, since it's pub published by Nature. It is an open access journal, but it does cost to publish. Um, so, yeah, there... However, the da underlying data sets are, of course, open access because they undergo a peer review process and they are fully um, citable objects. Um, they use um, what they call data descriptors, meaning that your data set comes with a data descriptor article which um, describes in more detail what the data set is about and um, makes it a citable nature publication just, just concerning your data, and as the speaker this morning said, giving you credit for sharing your data set. A similar example, um, and this is just to highlight two examples that work more or less across disciplines, is um, Faculty of a Thousand. Uh, maybe you've heard about it because um, it's fairly innovative because everything is open. Um, it's the article is open and it's published immediately once you submit. There's a first version out there. The peer review is open, and um, the peer review is um, 
becomes a citable object as well. So um, all the, the reviewers are asked to um, speak up in the open. And the uh, underlying data um, is published in recommended repositories. They use, for example, Zenodo or uh, Fixture. If you've heard about Fixture, it's also from the Nature Publishing Group, a data repository. Um, so um, it's very, very transparent. That's why it says immediate and transparent publishing. It's very speedy. So um, everything becomes citable immediately. So if you're in a, in a rush to get your stuff out, I mean, this is um, an interesting place to go. One of the um, interesting things that are, is happening now more and more is um, connecting articles. And by articles, I now mean not only data articles or data journals, but also traditional articles that you publish in Nature, nature Science, Cell, or um, wh wherever, and data repositories. This means that, um, in, for example, in this example from Elsevier, you um, integrate the, um, the access number, in this case the accession number from GeneBank, or the um, um, DOI for the particular data set in your paper, and um, the users mouse over and um, get a visualization of your data and can immediately assess what um, the data, the underlying data is about. If this, such a thing happens during the peer review process, for example, this gives the reviewer, of course, additional data to work with. Um, another thing, and this goes again into the domain of reproducible research, is as I said, not only the open data stuff that I just talked about. For me, open data also means code. Um, and not just um, the, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so um, what does it mean? Um, there is a new initiative, I mean, since maybe half a year, to um, make also software or code snippets, publish, um, published items, citable items. We do this um, with the Zenodo repository. Um, Lars will talk about this in the session af afterwards in more detail. This means if you publish, if you use GitHub, I'm pretty sure some of you use GitHub um, because I mean, I, everyone who codes nowadays uses GitHub, um, or more or less. So if you use GitHub, you have um, your analysis code ready. You can um, preserve a snapshot of your code, um, assign a DOI to it, and um, make it a citable object, which you can again reference in your paper, uh, which you publish in Nature or Science or wherever. This uh, has been done by Zenodo. This has also been done um, by the Mozilla Science Lab. So there are several initiatives um, you could use um, to do this. And I'm going to show you um, later when I move to the physics example a bit how this looks like in practice. Also, there are new journals um, out there which allow you, um, similar to this nature scientific data um, kind of thing, um, to write an article describing your software. So this means, um, I mean, in German we call it salami tactic. <laughs> um, and I'm very sure that, um, I know it exists in Spanish too, and no, actually don't know how it uh, is in English. Um, but the slice, salami slicing uh, tactic, <laughs> um, I know it's a very questionary practice. Um, however, I mean, if we look into the rea reality, um, I mean, everyone does it. Um, and um, in this case, um, I think we are a bit moving into the direction of um, this practices or supporting it. However, um, I do think um, producing articles for um, software, um, data, and the interpretation thereof, there are also journals now for um, new methods, um, new instrumentations, new calibration uh, mechanisms, for example. Um, there are journals for this too. It's an interesting changing paradigm because it encourages everyone, or me or us, um, to provide a better documentation, which is even peer-reviewed in most cases, and you become a citable output out of it. So um, other, uh, I'm curious to hear opinions about this. Um, other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, um, let me move to something. Well, can I spare this question? Um, yeah, um, because actually I'm moving there now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 
Oh, interesting uh, question. Because uh, I just had a uh, discussion last week with the, the eLife guys um, that was mentioned this mor morning also, this Max Planck Society um, journal um, that is um, ramped up with a very heavy effort. And I had, my understanding is that there are initiatives moving into that direction. Um, however, um, there are huge concerns, because, um, which I also understand. Um, I, I personally think we should publish them. However, I have myself never published a negative <laughs> result also, because, I mean, no one wants to have their names associated to a negative um, statement. I see a shaming head, yeah, but... Um, Uh, no, now I think we are misunderstanding each other. Uh, yeah, well, it should. I mean, that, that's. Uh, I mean, um, one of the ideas of open data is, of course, um, if it's part of the peer review, that um, you understand. I mean, um, if the reviewer looks at the data and the article, if there is a wrong result, that it should be detected. Um, I mean, but this is part of the no should be part of the normal peer review process. Um, I thought you were um, talking about um, like tests that didn't run and um, things like this. So um, because there are ideas to have ju dedicated journals um, for um, research results that didn't work out, and which I think is a great idea. But I'm, um, as I said, I mean, I, I think there will be lots of hesitation which needs to be overcome. Um, that's. Uh, so, more questions, concerns? Good. Um, moving to the citability thing. Um, I will skip the licensing because we can talk about this afterwards and it's a very difficult topic. Um, um, for me, um, no, well, not only for me, um, I do think, um, well, I do know that there is um, now a standard for um, citable research, um, which actually already exists um, since decades and you are fairly, well of it, fairly well aware of it because you have been using it for ages and that's uh, using um, DOIs, digital object identifiers. So um, what does it mean? Um, um, if you have published with Nature, Elsevier, whatever kind of journal, they've always assigned a DOI to it which you included in your references. Usually, I mean, either if you computed them automatically um, or not, doesn't matter, the DOI or the archive preprint in physics was usually part of it. Why is that? Because the DOI is a persistency guarantee because it always, um, it has, it's part of uh, the DOI registration agencies which guarantee that um, the DOI, um, the homepage where the published article sits is resolved. Um, this is now also applied to data or software, as I expressed uh, earlier, meaning that um, is, this is uh, using the same data repository that I highlighted earlier, this gray box on the right, so that you include such a DOI, which then resolves to the data set on the data repository page or to the data article. Um, and um, yeah, you can include this in your reference list. So this is um, a standard for um, a citable object, um, which is, let me skip this, used, um, for example, in um, this Force 11 data citation principles. This um, is something I love, honestly, because it has been endorsed by all the main publishers. So what, what does it mean? Um, if, I encourage you, if you're interested um, in um, data citation, to really look at this in more detail, because it's, it's very short. It's just um, some bullet points explaining what you have to do. Uh, and you basically have to use um, the referencing that you have been using for ages, just apply it to data. Um, you need an author of the data set, a publication year of the data set, data set title, a data repository or a data journal, whatsoever, a version and a unique identifier. Unique identifier sounds a bit mysterious maybe, it's just the DOI. You usually get it from trusted repositories, you get it for free, like Zenodo. I mean, we have to pay for it, but you get it as a user for free. Um, and then it's important, as you will see later in one example, that you include this reference in the reference list 
of the article where you use the data set. Um, why is this so? Uh, well, because we use text mining um, to um, detect the references. If you just um, hide it in the acknowledgments or somewhere else, it's for us a bit more difficult um, if you don't follow the standards. Um, but I mean, this is um, just a matter of um, our processing endeavors. Um, does this answer a bit your question? Okay. Yeah. Yes, because um, I don't know if this is, uh, I should say that in public, but this is a GitHub issue, because um, I personally would like to see that GitHub does it themselves, um, but um, GitHub is, um, GitHub's main research, uh, main, main community is not the research community, their core interest is not on, on such aspects, so that's why they preferred to run it through um, the Zenodo option and um, they don't assign DOIs themselves. That's why there is a detour. That's as, as simple as that. Um, I think, I mean, they could have done it themselves um, on their platform, it's true, um, without the Zenodo link, but um, they prefer the Zenodo link. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, the, the, um, there's a bit of a. Um, Zenodo is a preservation place, so we um, try to guarantee um, that um, if you have the DOI, we, the resolves to this place, and we um, g try to guarantee this um, and this ensured in the next years to come. Whereas uh, GitHub is more sharing place. Their main objective is not to preserve. Um, so we put the content yes. Uh, yes. We take a snapshot. We pull the content so to Zenodo, and it's an archive place in Zenodo in that sense. Um, yeah. So that's why the detour is there. Um, and again, uh, GitHub could have done that themselves, but they don't see themselves as a preserve, preservation platform, more as a sharing platform. So um, another. Um, uh, identifier that's important in this business is um, the ORCID ID. Um, Josh Brown is going to host a workshop um, right after as well, um, going into the detail how to get an ORCID, etc. Why is, does it matter um, for data publishing? Um, it matters because it is, enables you across data publishing platforms and traditional plat um, publishing platforms to um, aggregate your content and give the data the visibility you need. Um, I'm going to show you an example later on how this works in practice, but um, I, I encourage you um, to see Josh's session later. Um, the last um, standard that I would like to talk about um, is data um, peer review. And um, this is, um, I would say, a work in progress. There are lots of solutions around. Um, there are, which are fairly different, well, um, when it comes to different um, data products that we've already seen, like data records and data repositories, data journals, and there are also data, dedicated data articles in classical journals. In the geosciences, for example, that exists. The question is, uh, do, why do I need to register data on all these different journals and take, take uh, one identifier? Would it be sufficient if I put it on a lab web page or my home page, all the data? <laughs> data is published, there will be source code and all mm -hmm. data available on the web page. How different it is from these practices? Okay, um, I think that's a very valid question because um, first of all, the decision is of course up to you. Uh, I mean, um, up to now, um, until your institution or whatever tells you not to do it. So, but um, to, uh, 
make a mean comment. Um, but um, I th believe there are um, several aspects here. If you put it on your homepage, um, first of all, if you leave, I mean, I don't know if you're based at APFL, if you leave APFL, your homepage will most likely change um, if you haven't, don't host it yourself. If you host it yourself, you might have a contract that expires. Don't know. Um, so I don't think it's a very, um, I mean, it's not necessarily preserved um, as publishing standards. Um, second, um, and I personally think that for me that would be the most um, interesting one, and that's, um, is it um, um, yeah, a citable object? Um, I mean, is it uh, someone who has access the data or the software that, that sits on your homepage do you, um, I mean, this is actually a real question, do you tell the user if this is a peer-reviewed thing, um, does it have any branding um, on quality assurance and stuff like this? I mean, do you have, I mean, if you use GitHub, I mean, you might, I guess you might use issues and tracking stuff like this, right? So, I would say, for example, the data which I have published in a, in a journal, mm -hmm. and then the raw data, I could put it on my web page along with all the analysis scripts, and there complete tutorial how you can reproduce those figures and everything which reviewers can also refer to and normal people also and which could grow in the uh, future. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, I mean, th they could do so. Um, what I, if I were you, would be interested in, in um, understanding if others have reused the data um, that sits on your website, um, which you might not be able to track if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this is something that we work on now very heavily. Um, is I mean, that's why I'm advertising. I mean that's an advertisement what I do, right? Um, the DOI registration for that um, kind of data, because that and this is the, what this example here shows. Um, I'm going to do the, go this into the details. Um, if you put it in, the, in a recognized place and um, meaning which is you know retrievable. Um, accessible to aggregators and stuff like this, and I don't mean Google by aggregators here, um, you are able to see who has reused it and what they have done with it. So, um, and if they, um, if you've published it there, and if they use the identifier um, that has been associated with it. Um, so, and then, uh, but I will come to this um, in, to the, towards the end of my presentation, um, because there you will see how we do it um, at CERN in that regard, um, because, I mean, how you can integrate it in the tools so it becomes a bit smoother in the process. Um, but uh, and does it answer a bit? Yeah, okay. Um, where was I? Okay, the quality assurance, yes. Um, so obviously that depends. Um, I just mentioned um, this, um, the quality tag um, when it comes to the website. Um, this is, of course, a sad work in progress because um, we don't have super established data products. Yes, we have nature scientific data, we have faculty of the thousand, but um, not everyone who looks at the website knows what's behind it. So it obviously takes a bit of time, it's a changing paradigm that we always talk about to um, yeah, take this up. However, what does it mean? Um, even if you, well not even, if you put your data on a repository, for example the geoscience one, there is an internal um, data quality check which is, and for the geoscience one, not entirely visible. However, there are other solutions, for example, in the UK, where there are um, quality tags um, also for um, data repository, where it's visible for the user that there has been either a metadata review or really um, research review on the data. Um, as per um, the data journals that I've been talking about, there are different solutions. As I mentioned already, there's an open peer review, um, fully open, participative, everyone. I mean, I could go and comment on the physics peer review. I wouldn't because I don't, I don't know what to say, but um, you could. And um, also the review reports um, might be open and um, even become st c um, citable objects. I do think it's important to understand that we have two options. Um, publish data alongside your traditional articles in Science and Nature. So you put it into a repository, link it to the main article, and then um, your, article, your data set might be part of um, the overarching peer review that happens anyway, or you put it in a place where you know that your data 
is a standalone product um, and gets an independent peer review. Um, and I'm not saying that this is a set discussion. This is, I mean, something that's evolving. And I really think that everyone who's interested in this should just get their hands there and um, try to shape it as they like, because, I mean, this is now where the future is <laughs> being discussed. And um, now there are two <laughs> complex slides showing you um, what um, is being done in the background. And I don't, uh, I'm not going to run you through the details. Um, but this is the workflow for scientific data publishing. So this um, has been done by the editor, Ruth Wilson, or the publisher of this um, journal. And um, this is um, just to illustrate you um, that there are lots of um, quality assurance procedures in the background, working with data, reposit data repositories, etc., which make this a valuable product that goes beyond putting it on a website. And, and that's why it, this deserves um, yeah, a different tag and a different notion. And if I find, yeah. So there is, for example, as in the normal, sorry if I call it normal, the, the traditional um, publication, and then um, the classical peer review process, and the um, special data curator, which um, puts effort into the annotation and uh, metadata. The same is um, available for um, faculty of a thousand, which um, also um, goes, um, puts dedicated effort in, where is my mouse? I don't see it. Ah, here, in the um, data availability section. So they, ha they help you um, in creating uh, metadata and make this an understandable product for the outside. Um, so I wrote down some very, very simple guidelines. Um, they're not guidelines at all, actually. I mean, it's just some very simple step um, how to do it um, using the standards that I described. But I'm going to show this um, to you another time, but to the, towards the end. Um, I would like to illustrate this a bit um, more to you using the case I'm working with, which is high energy physics. Is there anyone from physics Are you doing something related to high energy physics in CERN here? No. Good. Um, any questions meanwhile? Yeah? Oh, wait a minute, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, an uh, on honest answer, um, as far as I know, um, it really depends how lucky you are. Huh? Um, because, I mean, there are some publishers who move this from one platform to the other. I've seen examples um, in... Um, actually here in Hydrogen Physics, I'm not going to name the journal, where they um, put it actually on a, um, on a well, it's not, it's not, it was not a personal website, but um, I mean, it was a publisher's website, but not really part of the platform, and where, where, where they actually lost supplementary data. Um, I mean, they just, they migrated to a new platform, was gone. Um, well, luckily we had it on our platform still, but I mean, um, you know, these are the cases where it gets tricky. Um, there are now, um, also Zenodo is involved in some of these discussions, there are publishers who think about taking this, um, the, the entirety of their supplementary data and moving it into, for, to places like Zenodo and then enhancing their old supplementary file system by using these new standards. Yes? I don't want to take time so that you can speak about your example, but very quickly, I'm coming, I'm digital archivist in a, a government administration, and I'm here today, let me, maybe like uh, some schnupperle, some schnupperle to make a, a little bit to see what is going on with uh, research data. And I, I found it really interesting to see that preservation was a big concern also, beside the open aspect. And I would be really interested to see what is the landscape or the scope of, when you speak about preservation, what does mean? What does it mean in the domain of research data? Mm -hmm. How long and uh, How what, long? Exactly, oh, yeah. <laughs> also, what, what exactly is included in the idea of like, we want to preserve the data? so that they can be recitable and so on. Thank you. Um, how long is a very difficult question. Because, um, I mean, it shouldn't be a difficult question, um, but it is a difficult question because um, the data volumes uh, increase significantly. I mean, we are in the perfect example. 
So, um, and yes, we keep everything for the time being forever. Um, at least we try to keep it forever. Um, but what does forever mean? Because, um, I mean, and uh, there is, because I mean, at some point you might, I mean, we don't, at CERN, we don't um, reach uh, storage uh, limitations, but um, there are other disciplines where there's, uh, they have storage limitations um, and um, where this is an issue. And there, the question of um, preservation timescales is, in my opinion, very, very um, strongly associated to the question of um, selection, um, and which is a very difficult question. That's why I called it a difficult question, because um, someone, and this is the question, who has to decide which data are stored forever um, or which data um, could be moved to the bin. Because if we talk about reuse and reproducible research, of course, reproducible research with the scientific claims that I said should be preserved forever, in my opinion. And we should make any effort to make this happen. If we talk about reuse, this becomes a bit more difficult um, if we talk, because we don't know. If there, is there a new method, a new, um, I don't know, a new computing algorithms? Um, I mean, that um, could help us um, processing this data set in a completely new way. I mean, we don't know if this um, um, it might happen in five ways, and we've moved it. Someone decided to move it into the bin. Um, so, I mean, this is a very, that's why I call it a difficult question. Um, because if, if you start discussing time frames, and usually, I mean, like in Germany, you, um, for example, you talk about 10, 15 years, but I mean, this might not be enough. Uh, because, for example, I mean, talk about LHC data, um, there is some data um, we could compare it with now um, from 20 years ago, so the time scale would, is, would be useless. So I had the feeling, no? Okay. Um, so I didn't give you a real answer, just more. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, yeah, I think the answer varies depending who you ask. Um, my opinion is that um, for any scientific claim we make, we have to make any effort to make this uh, forever pre preservation. Um, just. And I think this is a joint um, endeavor. How much time do I have left? Do we have left? Yes, I can hear you at least. Okay, no, that's good. I will just quickly run you through the. Um, is it better? Yes. So uh, to ask, uh, to, to, to continue about your question, um, the question of um, uh, sustainability of this uh, data set, accessibility and reuse is exactly the same for electronic articles. Um, so far, the best storage uh, strategy is paper, according to me. <laughs> it is not electronic PDFs. We perfectly know that PDFs will disappear uh, or read readable, um, how do you say, um, the ability to read a PDF through the time is quite short, in fact. Uh, there are some very interesting studies about it, uh, depending on the, the source, of course, how that was used uh, to generate the PDF and also the, the evolution of the standard. But sometimes it is 15 years or 10 years, and after this while already, especially for images and graphs, and graphs in science are very uh, precious. There are data, <laughs> a rep uh, representative data, and so um, you can ask if, uh, for the moment, I could see that in PLOS journal, the link towards the standards uh, mini set of data is in the format of Excel. And what is the <laughs> time life of Excel sheet? Uh, I personally have big doubt about sustainability of uh, about a spreadsheet of Excel. But, uh, yeah, this is my opinion. So. I have some doubts in that uh, in that regard too. Um, let me quickly um, run you through, um, a, it's a bit of a visualization of what I've just said um, for high energy physics. Um, the starting point is um, some recent developments that we have, meaning that um, all the big experiments on the uh, Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, have um, written their own data policies, meaning that three out of, out of four um, do have regular open data releases, the first one to come in some days. Um, with um, some announcement, hopefully. So um, there is some movement there, and um, they also 
I mean, this is, I have to admit, a very new field for us. Um, I know that this morning it was said that we have lots of experience with data and um, open access. For open access, that's very true to, um, I mean, to publications. Data, I mean, even though we do lots of big data stuff, open data was big, uh, new for us as well. Um, so we had to build up um, the, our own tools, etc., as well. So, um, and I start from the paper um, that describes the discovery of the Higgs boson, um, which you might have heard of. And um, this is a community tool. It looks like 70 style, but this is um, the main platform that we have to access um, literature in hydrophysics. Um, and this is um, already um, the landing page, meaning uh, that you have done a Higgs search and uh, you reach this thing. And where is my mouse here? Um, and then you see, too, this is um, describing the paper. And then you, the circle is around the data tab. Um, which um, contains data set underlying this um, Higgs discovery. There are three of them, and each of them is an independent um, object in this um, platform. Um, they have their own data summary, and um, if you click further, you see what I um, told you before, um, the standards for data citation. Each of these data sets has, comes with a citation recommendation, comes with a digital object identifier, the DOI, and um, with a short description, usually a visualization. This is not here um, for this data set because it's a fairly low level one. However, um, what I said before is um, what we do with it is we do the citation tracking. And quickly after this data set was shared, we had um, the first citations. Now we're up to five um, data citations. Um, for this record, um, which I said before, we use text mining for. And um, that's how it looks like. Um, I said it's, I mean, in the end, it's um, all I can say, unfortunately, is it's nothing fancy because we just use the established paradigms that you are already aware of. We just apply it to data. Um, so the six, seven, and eight are um, the data um, publications. Um, coming with a an author's author list, we have there are 3,000. That's why it says um, Atlas Collaboration to replace the 3,000 names. Then the data title and um, the object identifier. If it had versions, etc., that would be listed there too, but it doesn't. So um, that's very easy reference data. We do have the same for code um, on the same platform. It's exactly the same thing. You have, and this is data associated to an article again. You um, reach um, the article page, data tab. You follow the data tab, have a description of the DOI to facilitate the citation. And then you can track it. Also, this one now has the first citations. This is a more recent screenshot from, from some days ago. It has, also has three data sets now. We do have um, dedicated submission interfaces. Um, highlighting the DOIs, et cetera, so that we, our researchers are encouraged to do it and not to put it on their homepage or um, this, any certain website or internal platforms. Um, and I have to say, um, our feedback is quite positive so far on exactly this um, data citation tracking. Because, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not only an advertisement I do, it's really um, actually a control mechanism because you are able to see what others have been doing with your stuff, um, as simple as that. I want to underline um, the ORCID application. And um, that's a picture of Kyle, because I use Kyle as an example. We have, um, I mean, you can call, could call them institutional profiles. Um, it's on the same pl platform that I showed to you. So Kyle has a platform, a, a website there, which we run. We aggregate the content from the publication he has in physics. And now that we have data, aggregated in our, on our platform too. We distinguish publications, data sets, and external ones. External means um, not focused on physics, but for example, here's done lots of open science stuff, so um, comments there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the plans for the future for us is to extend our citation summary and um, Hirsch index um, to data related matters too. This hasn't happened yet, but I mean, this is work in progress. Why do I bring it up? I bring it up because um, Kyle use, uses ORCIDs. Um, 
I said there's a dedicated session starting now um, on this. Um, and this is quite important because, I mean, as you probably couldn't care less about um, our physics <laughs> platform, um, which I just presented, um, this ORCID tool gives them um, the option to integrate um, all the information that we are curating on Inspire, this platform that you've just seen, and push it to other platforms as well. Possibly, this is not yet there, but ResearchGate, for example. So he doesn't have to curate and put all this information on publications and data. <coughs> Sorry. Um, um, everywhere, he can just um, connect it with his ORCID and then it gets propagated to all the other endeavors. So that's how his ORCID profile looks like. Um, the, and I find this example quite interesting because um, it shows his works list. This is not a recent snapshot, but it nicely illustrates what I'm trying to say. Is that data, this is the data underlying the Higgs discovery, six ne next to the actual discovery paper of the Higgs boson. So on this platform. Um, and actually, I wanted to show you two tools that um, we develop in physics for <coughs> reproducibility and reuse, but I'm going to skip this because um, this is, since we are running out of time, I'm just um, finishing up with um, what we discussed um, and um, what I said. And um, uh, I think it's fairly easy to do data publishing because um, we, even though it's an evolving field, we are, um, have workflows and strategies and standards that are usable because we have been using them for ages. We just didn't apply them yet to data. So you can just do it. Um, you can do this for data and code and whatsoever. And I think I hopefully showed you also that um, you can still have, I mean, you still have the control of your data. You might even have more control if you do use the standards. Um, there are measures to do it also with confidential data. You just have to use the right places. Uh, the next session will probably tell you more about this, to how to find the right place. Um, you even get help in uh, data documentation and metadata um, provision, and you might actually get citations, um, which I guess everyone is a big fan of. So, and that's what I tried to convey, and I'm happy to take more questions. <coughs> <coughs> yes. Um, well, technically, it doesn't differ. Um, uh, what will differ is how it counts, uh, or how we count it. Yes, I mean, um, if I understand. Yes. The, the, I, what, um, this 411 principles are endorsed by all these publishers. Meaning, um, what they are, will try to do, this is work in progress here, um, the technical side is work in progress, um, that um, if you compile your reference list, it will um, end up on the same one. Um, and um, depending on which style you use, APA or, um, I mean, whatever BibTeX format um, you apply, um, I mean, it should um, be formatted the same way using um, the components that I described. Is this the... Why do we forget about that? Yeah, but that's okay. Um, I mean, uh, you can, no, no, I mean, sorry, I don't, there's not, this is not a measure to um, standardize um, all the citations across journals. They still have the individual styles. It's just that within the style, the data citation takes um, the same style as a normal journal reference. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Or am I confusing you? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but I, it's not my role to standardize the journal, <laughs> the journal references. But um, what is missing here, um, um, openly speaking, is um, better collaboration with, um, I don't know, Mendeley and um, things like this to better compile data set references. But I mean, I said, I mean, this is just, a, I mean, this is work in progress, so. Okay.